At the dawn of the 21st century, water is gravely wounded. While on its surface, scabs of dirt and detritus form. On the inside, dying in many places, water hides only poisons and desolation. Its capacity to generate life, health, and beauty has been depleted. And water needs voices to speak in its name, give opinions, make demands, raise consciousness, and influence attitudes. The water problem, which 30 years ago was basically thought to be limited to less developed countries, has now become a worldwide problem. At present, the trickiest and most complicated problem with water in the world is that there is a crisis, and this crisis is a crisis of governability. Ninety percent of the water we're dumping out into the world, the water we're dumping in our rivers, is water that hasn't been treated or purified. So we're injecting contaminated water into the veins and arteries of our planet. And that water is becoming a poison for our ecosystems, a poison for species of wildlife, and a poison for us. If you'll notice, in just a few years, there's been an enormously spectacular change in relation, not just to the amount of water we need, but also with regards to water's cleanliness. Water used to be a naturally clean resource. It was supplied directly to us by Mother Nature. But now we need to recycle it. We need to reuse it where appropriate. And above all, we need to put a new system of water management in place. There are two main problems in our oceans, two main sets of problems. There's pollution on the one hand and overfishing and destruction of the habitat on the other. As far as pollution, most of the pollution in our oceans comes from or has its origins on land. It enters the ocean through rivers, through contaminated continental water, or it's produced by oil tankers by other boats that clean out their tanks or dump wastewater, or boats that drag exotic species from one corner of the planet to another in their ballast water. That is to say, there are a host of problems that spread pollution from one part of our oceans to another. The other problem is the destruction of our freshwater ecosystems, such as our wetlands, of which over 60% have essentially disappeared over the last 30 years, and our rivers. Rivers are being destroyed mostly by the construction of major infrastructures. Most of the world's big rivers, the Ganges, the Indus, the Mekong, the Rio de la Plata, and the Rio Grande, are now threatened by construction of major infrastructures. And the last of these major threats is climate change. This climate change is really going to make water a lot more scarce. It's going to drastically reduce available resources, and in addition, it is also going to multiply the effects of these problems and thus aggravate the water crisis. At the United Nations, we define the water crisis as a crisis of governability when, for instance, 
a country does not have a high-level water authority, when the water authority is not 100% implicated in the problem, but is simply a neutral authority that manages both the water supply and the demand for water. The problem we humanitarian organizations are up against, particularly with regards to sanitation and water, is that 1,100 million people worldwide have no access to water and 2,600 million people do not have access to basic sanitation, which consequently means that many of the water sources they use are contaminated because there's no infrastructure in place to properly handle and treat sewage water. The consequences of this water crisis we're talking about are very clearly evident. There are direct consequences for our ecosystems. Many of our most important river systems are being profoundly disturbed. Many of our most important wetlands, which are essential for maintaining biodiversity and also play a crucial role in many local economies, are now disappearing. If we think just in terms of biodiversity, for instance, in the past 30 years, the species that have suffered the greatest decline have been freshwater species. The populations of 50% of all the freshwater species in our rivers and wetlands have dwindled or disappeared entirely only within the last 30 years. So you see, the impact on biodiversity is very, very serious. And in terms of humanity, it's important to bear in mind that, according to the United Nations, we are already using 50% of all available water today. But in just 20 years, it's estimated, we'll be using three-quarters of all the fresh water available on the planet Earth. If we're using 50% right now, and already we have serious water usage problems all over the world, we can only expect these problems, destruction of our ecosystems, intensive use of water, to become worse and aggravate an already serious situation. Situations of conflict and problems with drought will be seriously aggravated. Flood emergencies will be seriously aggravated. And that also has social implications and even health implications. That's to say, pollution will surface in areas that are currently suffering from drought. At present, fishing has become one of the main threats, if not the main threat, facing the seas and the biodiversity of marine life. The United Nations estimates that 70% of all the fishing grounds in the world are already being overexploited. 90% of large fish, large predators such as tuna fish, swordfish and sharks have already disappeared. And this has all happened in about 20 years. Nowadays, human beings have an impressive capacity to chase down every last fish, and that's exactly what we're doing, using technology that's virtually militaristic. We're using the most sophisticated boats, the most sophisticated technology, in order to catch every last fish. Forget all those romanticized notions about fishermen. We're talking about huge multinationals that are simply ransacking the sea, oftentimes with government support. Then there are the small-scale coastal fishermen who need our support, and we are supporting them in many and varied ways. But the sea is basically being ransacked, emptied by these big companies, big multinationals, at an impressive rate, and they are protected by the fact that there is no law at sea. There are biological studies that will tell you how much of a certain stock of fish can be safely used. I think studies are carried out, especially in our country, where fishing is obviously a very important industry. There's an ample base of marine biologists who study the science of the sea, etc. 
and who understand certain things very clearly. That is, I don't think it's a problem of defining concrete environments. It's more a question of monitoring the industry to make sure it doesn't overdo it, that it's not overfed. If the state has the ability to do anything, it is to regulate things and to make sure laws are enforced. I think that's essential in this matter. Also self-regulation. Fishing industry organizations should be aware of the fact that they are effectively provoking biological stress and that they should really do something to minimize this. They must adapt to biological circumstances and not expect biological circumstances to adapt to the fishing industry. To solve overfishing, it would suffice for governments and international organizations the world over to simply have the political will to sort out the issue. If you can fit a thousand, a hundred thousand, or twenty thousand, or however many boats in the sea, that's how many should be fishing, not two or three times as many, which is happening now. Nowadays, scientists are absolutely able to calculate the precise quantity of fish the sea is capable of producing. Fishing grounds aren't what they were 50 or 100 years ago, when there really was this idea that they were inexhaustible and that you could catch as much as you wanted. Fortunately, nowadays, the data scientists have is very reliable and we know exactly how much stock of any given fish population can be caught before this fish population begins to collapse. <laughs> At the rate it's going, the disappearance of our fishing grounds will have an enormous impact on the lives of future generations. But this won't only impact these future generations, who will be left with an impoverished sea, who won't even see, much less consume, some of the extraordinary fish we used to see at the fishmongers, because these have practically disappeared. This will also have a tremendous impact on those local communities who depend on fishing for their livelihood. What we're seeing in many parts of Africa is, in coastal areas where people's only source of livelihood is fishing, and where huge fleets have taken practically all the fish there was, the only source of life or resources that these and many, many other people in Senegal, Mauritania, had has been destroyed. So now these people are emigrating towards Europe because their main source of livelihood, which was fishing, has disappeared. The issue of overfishing isn't just about how much fish is caught, which for a long time now has been greater than the amount of fish produced by the oceans, greater than the ocean's capacity to produce. Another factor is that, quite often, the methods used for fishing are incredibly harmful to the seabed. That's the case with bottom trawling. It's the case with spears and with a whole series of fisheries that don't just overfish, but also harm habitats, thus preventing the ocean from recovering and from recovering its capture capacity. In the last 10, 20, 40 years, we've seen that the problems with overfishing and destruction of habitats have done a lot more harm to the seas than has pollution in these same decades. Any issue that has to do with environmental use, in essence, has to do with life. So fish farming, ichthyology, and flora and fauna in general are very important users of our water resources. And they never become a danger to these resources. That's part of the environment's nature. They're natural users. What's important is that the use made be rational. It is essential that agriculture be carried out in a responsible and sustainable manner. This is fundamental, not just for our economy, but to prevent people from migrating, and also in order to preserve nature and biodiversity. But we must find, regain a balance by implementing an agriculture that is respectful of the resources it depends on. And this bears no resemblance with agriculture as it is currently practiced today by most of the industry in our country and in the rest of Europe. Of that 100% of fresh water we spoke about earlier, 75% is used in agriculture. In Spain, it's 
and in less developed countries it can be between 80 and 85 percent. This tells us that rich countries are the world's most important consumers of water, since in poor countries the main consumer is agriculture. But unfortunately, the agricultural sector is very inefficient in its use of water. There are currently over 11 billion people in the world who don't have access to safe water and over twice as many, 26 billion, who don't have access to basic sanitation. These figures are impressive and they indicate that somewhere in the world, a child dies every three seconds due to water-related problems. Now, we cannot look at this issue as something that affects only poorer countries. In the 27 member states of the European Community, there are 100 million people who have no access to safe, basic sanitation. 80% of fatal childhood diseases in the world are caused directly by problems related to water and sanitation. One of the main causes of death in children is diarrhea, which kills about 4 million children a year. This illness is totally curable and easily prevented. Simply ensuring access to water, as well as access to a sanitation infrastructure that would make good hygiene habits possible, would greatly reduce death rates from one of the main causes of infant mortality. We must rework the way we think about water and begin to see it as a human right. Because if we claim that water is life, we must act consequently within the technical framework to promote an adequate use and management of water, but above all, in terms of political responsibility. It is simply not acceptable that people should be dying of hunger and thirst every single day. We tend to forget the value of water in and of itself, the ecological, economic and social value that water has. That's to say the capacity that water has as a whole. We cannot live without water. I don't think we're truly aware of just how important that fact is. And obviously in that sense it's a non-renewable resource. That's to say we cannot consider water a permanently renewable resource and no. It must be considered a non-renewable resource. That fact, the fact that many countries question whether it is a public resource, I think those are the three reasons, shall we say, that there is currently such an incredibly important debate around the issue of water. Businesses have had to be forced to change their production processes in order to stop polluting, and in order to force them, it was necessary to pass legislation, it was necessary to pass laws and to impose fines. By the time conservationists and even some scientists realize that there are problems with a certain species at sea, fishermen have already detected it ten years earlier because they're out at sea every day. If you're exploiting an orange roughy fishery in New Zealand and those fish are sold in Stockholm, with the CO2 emissions you're giving off in order to transport that frozen fish by airplane or boat or whatever, you're also contributing to increasing climate change. That is to say, the elements that factor into the equation are debatable and organizations often debate them. We must reduce worldwide agricultural water consumption. We cannot continue to use most of our water to promote, to encourage, or to grow thirsty crops that are using up the greater part of our resources, are contaminating our aquifers for hundreds of years to come, and are also drying up our rivers. It's extremely urgent that we reform agriculture and create an agriculture that is compatible and more sustainable. 
Second of all, we must stop allowing, we must make society understand, make our politicians understand, that if we do not have healthy ecosystems, if we do not have healthy rivers, if we don't have well-managed wetlands, we will not have water. Rivers are not simply navigation canals or pipeworks used to carry water. They are living ecosystems that we must take care of if we are to ensure that we'll have water in the future. So we must stop transforming or disturbing our rivers. And thirdly, we must work to eliminate pollution in our water. And last of all, it's essential that we take the fight against climate change seriously. Climate change will drastically reduce the already scarce amount of water we have access to at the moment. So if we do not put all these measures into place, and if we do not effectively fight against climate change, the near future with regards to water, with regards to an element that is absolutely vital for humanity, is really rather bleak. Environmental policy should become a policy of policies. That's to say it should not be a complementary policy, but should influence every policy. Climate change and hydrological policy are telling us that environmental issues have implications for other policies, health policies, agricultural policies, as well as hydrological policies themselves. I think that's a fundamental step. That, and that international organizations and the world's most powerful countries should really consider the environment, environmental sustainability, to be the underlying issue at the base of the political agenda. What we must do is listen to the voices of scientists, allowing for a margin of error because they can make mistakes and make decisions that will allow the fishing grounds to recover and will allow us to have healthy fleets, safe fleets, fleets that are proportional to the number of the capacity that fishing grounds have to reproduce. And that's viable. It's just a question of them wanting to do it. The water issue is a long-term issue. We're talking 20, 30, 40 years. That's why it's important that the water issue become a matter that is of state concern. That's the first step. The second step is to recognize that our infrastructures have a series of virtues that ensure that in times of scarcity, we will use water that has been stored or that is already found within the infrastructure. And when the floods arrive, it should be able to absorb this water, to create reservoirs in order to avoid floods downstream. Then, the United Nations has again brought up the issue of developing infrastructures that are designed with an eye to minimizing environmental impact and ensuring that the center of gravity is to prevent people around the world from dying. We should start by understanding the importance of this resource. I think we should know that the same volume of water that we use so unwisely must be returned to nature in good condition. Raising prices could be an important step, but I think it's more important that we become aware and understand that it's a limited resource and we need to manage it well so that we can live better with a lot less. On the one hand, at the moment, there is a lot of confusion, but at the same time, we have a great deal of expectation. This is a time of hope, because if we keep these three levels in mind, uh, civil society, the scientific and academic community, and uh, democratic governments, I think that those measures really could be adopted and that they would change our water culture. We have an obligation to the 180,000 human beings that are born each day on this earth. We have an obligation to leave a less messed up and less dismal place behind for them than the one we currently have. The future of our planet inevitably depends on water's quality.
water should reflect the sensitivity and progress of a society that's bent on recovering a generous and pulsating natural world, full of life, beauty,